everyone. <clears throat> Welcome. I'll let everyone join. We're going to be talking about reactivity management today. <laughs> um, and I apologize for wearing a blanket, but it's really cold. Um, so <laughs> if anyone has any questions about their reactive dog, uh, pop it in the chat or in the question area. Um, and I will do my best to answer. I'm expecting a call. So and I'm going to try and make this 10 minutes. All right, because uh, that's all I have. But I wanted to jump on. So um, if you folks are here, maybe you have a reactive dog, a dog that performs lungy, barky behaviors that could be towards other dogs, animals, people, bicycles, scooters, all sorts of things. Right. Management. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, when we're starting any training plan, uh, a management a management plan is absolutely key. So management basically means we have this problem, right? It's going to take us a while to fix the problem, meaning to train alternate behaviors, to change emotions. So what are we going to do in the meantime? Uh, and in the meantime, we're going to minimize putting them in situations that they cannot yet handle. Um, a kind of analogy that I often use is like, say we want to give up smoking. I smoked cigarettes for uh, 10 years. Um, and when I wanted to quit, I had to put a lot of management on myself. So I stopped going out to bars. I stopped drinking coffee. I actually stopped hanging out with a bunch of people because they all smoked. Because if I was around that, if I had those stimulus, that stimulus all around me, that if I had just like a packet of cigarettes laying on the table or if I smelt the smell of tobacco smoke, it would be an antecedent that a kind of thing that triggered me to perform the unwanted behavior of smoking. So management in that case meant, you know, really managing my environment and the people that I was around to ensure that I was able to perform the behaviors that I wanted. It's the same thing for your dogs, right? We need to minimize putting them in situations where they're practicing the bunk barky lungy behaviors. Um, that's simple when said like that, but actually in practice can be a lot more complicated because many of my clients um, live in places like New York, London, LA, Washington, um, and I worked for six years in Manhattan in New York. Uh, now I work in London. So I'm well aware that it's much easier said than done in a majority of cases. Um, so for many dogs that we have who live in hectic urban environments, pardon me, <clears throat> we will be counseling clients in minimizing walks, maybe to necessary potty walks. Say we have like a 50 pound pit bull in a, in a high rise in Manhattan. We're not really gonna be able to get that dog peeing inside, are we? Um, so we are probably uh, gonna have to take it out three times a day, four times a day, maybe. Um, and when we do that, we're gonna try and make the walks as quick as possible. And we're gonna be trigger dodging. I call it playing Pac-Man. I don't know if anyone's ever played Pac-Man. You're the little Pac-Man and the ghosts are everywhere. And whenever you see a ghost, you go Ugh! and you turn the other direction and run. And sometimes when you're playing Pac-Man, it can feel a little bit silly because you're like turning left, turning right, turning left, Ugh! up here, down there. That's kind of normal. We're playing an avoidance game with lots of uh, reactive dogs, not just getting them to pee and poop outside, but in keeping their nervous systems calm because reactive dogs often have like inflammatory nervous systems that quickly uh, flare into states of like activation. So we're gonna be minimizing walks for the majority of the dogs, especially in the urban environment, because just like um, Rosie says here, my dog can't cope with coming out of the building and onto the main road. And Rosie, you're not alone at all, especially for pandemic puppies. Um, you're I know here that see that Rosie, you're in London. And even in, um, you know, some like r more, um, not rural, but you know, like suburban environments, it can be too much for the animals. So a big question we get when I say to folks, you know, I don't want you to take your dogs around their triggers anymore. That might mean cutting out trips to the park. That might mean cutting out their long walks around the neighborhood. I get a lot of folks being like, oh my goodness, how am I gonna tie my dog out? I have a high energy, active breed. You know, I work um, mostly with like high drive working dogs. So lots of like herding dogs, bully breeds, um, terriers and hunting dogs. Um, and it can feel impossible. I promise you it's not impossible. <laughs> um, one of the biggest myths is that walking a dog around a neighborhood, for example, meets all of their needs. Another big myth is that, you know, your dog needs to go to the park and run around for one, two hours a day in order to get their energy out. I definitely was dependent on my trips to Prospect Park with my dog when he was younger. But what I didn't realize was that those trips were actually making his behavior problems worse. 
because he was going into Prospect Park. He was getting rushed by off-leash dogs. He was responding with aggression. Um, and I was really wish that I had someone at the time telling me, Krishma, you don't have to do this. <laughs> um, so some things that we counsel guardians to do is, you know, maybe rather than going to the park at the, the most busy time, maybe we go during an off period. Um, maybe we try to stick to the areas where of there. I lost you for a second, but uh, try to uh, go to the park at off-peak uh, off times. Um, walking, uh, you know, early in the morning, late at night. These can be helpful, but many dogs, we can meet the majority of their needs inside through like creative enrichment protocols and plans. So things that we will add in when we remove leash walks and park trips are things like canine fitness, proprioception work. So teaching dogs to like pivot, step up, back up, that kind of stuff. Um, we might uh, teach uh, scent work indoors. Uh, we might do things just like fun, stupid tricks, playing, therapeutic play. Um, and what I give for all of my clients and everyone that's all my CCA trainers, when we implement a management plan that is restrictive, we will add in extra enrichment that will meet their needs and give guardians targets to hit. Um, so, you know, two 15 minute play. Sorry, my Wi-Fi is funky. Um, two 15-minute play sessions a day, 30 minutes of enrichment, 20 minutes of scent work. And I often say to people, you know, right now you're taking your dog out for an hour and a half every single day on walks, for example. That hour and a half is still going to be spent <laughs> with your dog, <laughs> but you're just not going to be walking around the city. You're going to be in the house. You're going to be practicing stuff indoors with them. And that's usually in so many cases, it is absolutely fine. Um, I know that lots of guardians get kind of hooked on high energy games of fetch and lots of high uh, kind of energy dog play in the park, for example. Uh, I was there with you. I thought my dog needed an hour and a half in Prospect Park plus a half hour walk there and back every single day just to stay sane. What I didn't realize was that I was actually training an athlete who required that much exercise, right? So if we take our dogs out for two hours a day, guess what? We've created dogs that need to go out for two hours a day. Now it's a balance. Um, I don't want dogs that are overweight. <laughs> I don't want dogs with poor muscle conditioning. Um, that is not beneficial from a holistic perspective. So it's important that when we remove um, sort of things like walks and, and, and trips to the park, we add in as well. And in fact, many cases, guardians are spending just as much time, if not maybe even a little bit more time, making sure that their dog's needs are met indoors while keeping them safe. Oh, ED the Whippet says, loving these live videos, so helpful and encouraging. Oh, that is the goal. I want them to be encouraging because you're all doing a fantastic job. It's so tough with dogs that are reactive. I can tell you that myself. I, I, my biggest problem, biggest mistake I made with my dog was not having good enough management. You know, he was going out every single day and I was not putting the effort that I needed in to shielding him from situations that he couldn't handle. So he was having like four to five episodes a day where he was like on the edge, <laughs> like about to bite someone. <laughs> And that's not good. That's not a good mental, uh, not a good neural pathway to rehearse, to rehearse going through every day. Question here, how to manage reactivity during car rides? Fantastic question. Crates. <laughs> uh, crates in the car can be so helpful. You can put window film on the windows to blur their access to the outside. Um, for most dogs though, I'm gonna put them in a crate, I'm gonna cover that crate, and I'm gonna give them projects in the crate to do. Um, and it's probably gonna take a lot of um, conditioning to get them comfortable in there, um, but it's gonna be a case of like limiting their visual access to the triggers. So either we block the windows or we put the dog in something that we can then cover up so that when they have to go on their necessary car rides, for example, to the private field that you've hired or the park that's a little bit further out and quiet, um, you know, that they can go there without having their nervous systems pushed into these high, high states, these high activation states, which is not helpful. Honey Bear says, that's so interesting that you can create a dog that needs a lot of exercise. I know, right? I literally did it for Hera. Um, I'm constantly telling people, stop playing fetch with him. Stop throwing toys for him. I don't want you to build an athlete that I then have to maintain. I have him on a plan. He goes to the park every two days. He goes to run and, and do like high impact energy exercises every two days. And then on the off days, we do low arousal thinking work, brain work, not just body work, right? I don't want a dog that's like jacked up, but has no brain. <laughs> All that power needs control, right? And if you have like a, a high intensity breed, hunting breeds, 
um, you know, bully breeds, protection dogs, all these things. We really need to create balance, right? Uh, Denver says it makes sense if you run 5k every day. It gets easier over time and tires you out less and less. Yes. And sometimes you get into this habit where like, I can just run them and run them and run them and run them and they never slow down. And I'm like, hee hee, oopsie. <laughs> um, someone said here, lots of self care for the doggy guardians too. Absolutely. Um, management for reactive dogs is not just about managing the dog, it's about managing the caretakers, making sure that you go and get, you know, lots of time to yourself and recoup and, you know, get a therapist if you need to. I've definitely done it before, you know. Um, Got a question here from Roger the Whippet. Should I let my dog play with other dogs if he's reactive to dogs? Well, from my experience, there are different emotions that can underlie reactive behaviors. Usually from my experience, it's either a feeling of fear and discomfort, um, which means that, the, that we definitely shouldn't have them playing with those dogs because like my dog here, was very nervous around other dogs. And when I was a, a less experienced um, trainer, I would let him play and his play was super intense. It was not really controlled. It wasn't polite. It wasn't balanced. And really I was, it was like a fight. It was like a fight club. Like I, had, I was taking him out to the park and he, he was just beating up other dogs and they were beating him up. Um, so in that case, definitely not. Um, the other kind of emotion that often underpins reactivity is like a frustration, kind of a feeling we could maybe call frustration. I don't really know how we'd label that, but essentially the dog wants to get to that other dog. Um, I personally think that, you know, every dog that wants to be social should be given opportunities to be social with members of their own species. If we can do it in a way that re uh, removes them rehearsing the reactive behavior, that would be even better. Um, we don't necessarily want um, a pup to have experiences, buff, 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 I want to get to my friend, and then they get to their friend and get to play. It's a toss up though, right? Because if we said, okay, your dog cannot play with any other dogs ever, that could make it 10 times worse if that dog is hyper social, you know? So that's why speaking to a trainer and a professional, someone who's like really qualified and has like extensive experience and education is really helpful um, to kind of find out these like finite little points. Um, this is all helpful. Thank you so much. I'm so glad. Um, how to ju judge any dog that it attacked? I don't fully understand that comment. If you can expand a little bit more, I will uh, do my best to um, go into it. Okay, so um, I'm talking really mostly about management in terms of, um, you know, where environmental management, what we should be exposing our dogs to. Um, you know, if our dogs are fearful of people, for example, we're definitely not gonna be having tons of guests over until they're comfy, right? Pretty obvious. Um, and um, we might, put in place other things, you know? So for example, I have a dog in the house right now who's extremely predatory. She's a Romanian rescue and she has completed the predatory sequence many times, which is extremely reinforcing for that dog, right? So right now, while we're working on her behaviors, we're keeping her away from areas that are heavy with prey because we don't have that control in that environment yet. Um, so it's always a balance. It's behavior, behavior change is complicated. Um, can you expand on management to noises while in the car? Oh, noises. I thought you were talking about um, visual stimulus in the car. So before I mentioned like crating and putting window film maybe on the windows. Oh, hi. Hi, Tori. Um, <laughs> that's specifically going to be helpful for, um, you know, visual triggers. For noise triggers, um, good question. We could try to use a sound buffer, like some sort of... Um, like some sort of like white noise machine or the radio or like your favorite music turned up. Um, but if your dog is really struggling with noises, that can be challenging because it's hard to, to, to control. So I would really focus on getting a trainer involved who can help you counter condition and desensitize your dog to those noises using like science-based methods, which is something we do every single day. Um, Okay, Cindy says, my pup was bitten on the leash and now lunges at dogs who get too close. Poor baby. Um, I try to avoid dogs if I can on works. I've learned to manage the behavior but not fix it. So that's an example of trauma, right? Um, your dog has experienced a traumatic event because it was approached by a dog when it was on leash, it couldn't run away and it experienced a significant injury or maybe it wasn't significant, but it was significant to them, right? <laughs> um, in terms of like fixing that behavior, um, I'm not going to go into training plans to resolve reactivity today. I'm literally just talking about management. Um, definitely speak to a trainer because it can be resolved. It usually involves giving that dog many other positive experiences um, in that similar contingency. 
Um, my dog freaks out when she sees another dog on the walk. She pulls so hard, she loves walks, and I don't know what to do. Sabrina, that sounds really challenging, and I'm definitely gonna suggest that you speak to a trainer so that you can get like a proper holistic plan in place. Um, for your dog but for now all of those management tips apply you might not be taking your pup on walks anymore and instead we might be looking for more indoor enrichment activities so um, if anyone needs any information on this you can dm us and i'm happy to send you some links um, you know some youtube videos a pdf that we have about indoor enrichment stuff like that more than happy to do that um, but remember we this is never going to be a replacement for a professional we really need to um to speak to someone about this um, Rosie says, can you share a bit more about how to make um, breaks less stressful? She comes out of the building, lun building lunging and howling before she's even seen anything. That sounds so stressful, my love. I'm so sorry that you're experiencing that. Let me show you a quick video of something that you might want to be doing with your pups. And this game, it's just called the cookie toss game. It's hardly rocket science. But when I have dogs that are highly reactive and fearful, I will often take them out, literally tossing pieces of steak on the floor. Um, I once saw someone with a pet pig in Manhattan and they were walking their pet pig with a big uh, bag of carrots and they were taking two steps and then dropping a carrot and then taking two steps and dropping a carrot and I was like hey <laughs> that's how I walk a bunch of reactive dogs <laughs> um, so it can be really really helpful to just do a few steps and then toss like I'm talking steak right um, but if we're seeing explosive emotional um, events, we definitely need to consult with a professional and this is never going to be um, really enough. So this is just a little example of Theo in New York with our trainer Nicole and she's working with him, getting him outside comfortably. Um, first of all, just starting in the lobby, just tossing cookies and we do this, um, not actual cookies, I think they're probably using chicken or steak or something um, kind of lean and healthy um, and, and really liberally applying these reinforces. Uh, let me stop sharing for a second and see what other questions we have here. Um, food aggression is not something I'm going to go into today. Yeah, Denver Dog Trainer says, I've so seen some dogs get used to earmuffs. I have used earmuffs before. I've also used um, calming caps, which are caps that go over dogs' eyes that limit their visual exposure, kind of like wearing sunglasses. It's like a mesh. So it means that they can see, but they can't see just as much. And I personally believe that dogs can have sensory processing sensitivities like humans. Um, I don't have any studies about this. It's my personal opinion from my experience as someone who has sensory processing issues. <laughs> um, so that's just my personal opinion. Um, so I have seen earmuffs and like calming caps used as management strategies quite successfully. For the average dog guardian though, I find it's not gonna be as um, really gonna be a, as feasible as a, as a training plan. Um, dog has reacted to other dogs, guarding me. Tricky to manage because if I back off dogs approaching, I think it makes him more stressed. And Kate, that really sounds like a situation where, like for my dog Hera, I didn't take him to parks or the places where they were off-leash dogs for a long time until I could con control his behavior. And he could control his behavior um, because it's just like when I wanted to quit smoking, right? Um, if I want to quit smoking, I can't be going to the pub every night and sing with all of my friends because <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up a cigarette, right? It's gonna happen. That, that, that behavior is gonna be rehearsed. What if my dog seems like he wants to be social, wagging his tail, but once he gets close, he becomes reactive? Oh, great question. So first of all, a wagging tail does not always mean friendly. I would highly recommend you you just type into YouTube instinct wagging tail. There's a great video by my colleagues at Instinct in New York, a dog training um, studio, and uh, they have a great video explaining how wagging tails aren't always as uh, social. I used to think my dog was social too, um, because whenever he saw a dog, he would want to go right up to them and he'd jump on them and bite them and looked like it was play, but it wasn't play. The best analogy I have is, say you have someone who's really nervous about someone coming onto their property. That person in my head, maybe they're sitting on their porch with a shotgun on a rocking chair, you know? And whenever someone comes past, they rush up, get off my lawn, you know? That person is running up to that individual, right? Seemingly affiliative, but because of the context of their body language and the environment, um, we can see that even though they're moving towards that other person, it's not actually friendly. And I see this all the time. I see guardians mistake friendly behavior for hypervigilance. And I did it myself for multiple years. So you're not alone. <laughs> it's hard, man. It's hard. Um, 
Uh, Nina, hi my love. Oh, oh bless, thank you. Um, we wish we could get her to enjoy playdates again. She can't tolerate other dogs. And you know what? That's fine. <laughs> That's okay. I want to give people the okay. You know, your dogs don't have to be social with other dogs. Um, some people aren't social with other people that much, right? My dog Hera does not want to really play with other dogs. He loves people. He coexists with dogs totally fine. He's great around resources. But he doesn't really like playing with other dogs. He never learned when he was young, I don't think. I got him when he was like five months old, but I never taught him sure, certainly <laughs> at that early point in my career. So um, uh, I, I also want to say to folks out there that, you know, the goal for all dogs is not necessarily like super social, um, affiliative behavior. It can be just neutrality. And that is totally fine. Um, we just want them to be okay. Uh, it's normal for adults to not be super social with loads of different people. And uh, it's the same with dogs, right? I certainly aren't. I'm not super social with loads of people. Oh, bless you, Nina. It's lovely to hear from you and see you. All right, my loves. I think I did it. I have to go because I have a session in five minutes. Um, but it's so lovely to check in with everybody. We've got tons of people on here. This account is growing fast, hey? Um, it's nice to see everybody. Um, and, uh, okay, one last question and then I'm going to go. <laughs> I can't help myself. Um, I've taken my dog to the small dog park to meet other little doggos. We had a tennis ball and my dog was only interested in the ball and ignored the other dogs. Is that okay? Sounds like my dog. Uh, when my dog is in like a social situation, he's kind of like that person at the bar scrolling on their phone, ignoring everyone. He's like, just throw the ball. I don't even want to look at those people or those dogs. Um, and I think that it's useful to remember that if our dogs don't want to be around other dogs, I would probably just not take them around other dogs, just take them to another park where they can hang out um, and, uh, and, and do their own thing, do the thing that they like to do, which is potentially looks like play with you. Um, and maybe record a bit of uh, body language footage of your dog around other dogs, and then you can take that to a trainer and say like, hey, what do you think about this behavior? Do you think my dog is affiliative? Do you think I should continue to put them in this situation? Or do you think that they're not super comfy? And as always, when you're looking for trainers, make sure that you're looking for folks who are least invasive, minimally aversive in their methods. Uh, we don't want to be um, applying violence uh, or, you know, discomfort to any animal. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to be taught that way. And uh, we don't need to to um, uh, see progress. Um, I think someone just said, thanks, ma'am, which I love. Um, ma'am, you all have to call me ma'am now. All right, I'm going to go and um, go into my session. But it was lovely to chat to you all. And um, hopefully we'll be back on soon. Have a good one, guys. And let us know in the comments if you have any questions. Okay.